Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, today we are blessed to be prayed for by Jesus himself. Our gospel reading is from John chapter 17, the first part, and it's the first part of what is known as the high priestly prayer. Because Jesus, our great high priest, is speaking to God the Father on our behalf, is advocating for his people. How amazing is that? Jesus prays for you. Well, as I was preparing for this sermon, it reminded me of something I've read. Um, This is the book Grace Upon Grace by John Kleinig, and there's a part in it where he talks about prayer. And he references a situation that he remembers teaching a uh, middle school class as a chaplain and asking the the students the question, what's the very best thing that you as a Christian can ever do for another person? And of course, if you ever asked a classroom full of kids a single question, you get a lot of different answers. But one answer really stuck out to him. It was, uh, came from a quiet girl in the back, and here's what she had to say. She reckoned that you would do something even greater if you simply prayed for that person. When pressed to justify her claim, she maintained that by praying for people in need, we give them God's help rather than human help. We give God's grace and nothing but His grace. Everything else we do is tainted by the evil in us, but not prayer. Any other help, no matter how generous, puts down those who are helped and leaves them in debt to the one who has helped them, but not prayer. When we pray for others, we can do nothing evil but only good for them. We simply place them in God's hands and then withdraw. When we do that, they don't even know that we have prayed for them unless we happen to tell them. The class agreed with her, and they had a lively discussion about prayer. How often have you thought about prayer being the best thing as a Christian that you can do for another person? I'll be honest. I often overlook prayer. Even in the midst of trying situations, how many times, like me, have you all of a sudden realized you've been worrying about something for days and haven't once considered to offer it up in prayer to God? It's an easy thing to overlook, but I think that girl is right. It is the best thing that we can do for one another. After all, We're not giving them our help, but God's. And today in our gospel reading, this best thing is being done for you by your perfect and ultimate high priest, Jesus Christ. That's why it's called the high priestly prayer. What the high priest does is he speaks on behalf of God's people to God. He advocates for them. And Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of of that role. And he demonstrates the perfection of the purpose of the priestly office here in his prayer, advocating on your behalf to God the Father. Now before we get into what Jesus specifically says, I think we should look at what exactly a high priest is and does. That's a word that gets thrown out a lot, but how many of you have really looked into the Old Testament to see what exactly the high priest does? Most maybe know that Aaron was the first one, the brother of Moses, and God consecrated him to be the first high priest of God's people. And here are some of the tasks that he and other high priests were given. They oversaw the duties of the other priests, which was all the stuff that was, doing, that was going on in the tabernacle and then the temple, the sacrifices, the services, the prayers, the scriptures, all of that stuff. He was in charge of that group. He was the person that the people of God would seek in order to know God's will. And most important, the most important duty that he was given was to conduct the service once a year on the Day of Atonement. And once a year, he would enter into the most holy place, which at all other times was forbidden, for sinners cannot stand in the presence of God and live. But the high priest was given the important task of doing just that. 
And why was he able to do that? Well, it's because he was bringing in the blood of the sacrifices for the sins of the people and his own, thus making atonement for God's people. Does that formula of blood atoning for the sins of God's people sound familiar? Well, Jesus carries on the bloody tradition of the high priest, although in a different and better and more permanent way. You see, the high priests in the Old Testament, they were temporary instruments of God. And in their ministry, they pointed to the ultimate high priest who would make atonement for God's people once and for all, not with the blood of animals sacrificed on behalf of the people, but with his own perfect, righteous, and precious blood. Jesus is the perfection of the office of the high priest. He is the perfect and ultimate intercessory priest. And as you can gather from his prayer, he had a special authority to do so. So what does our high priest say in his prayer today? Well, first he thanks the Father for granting him the authority to do so. Right? And the Scripture's authority is always granted. It's never taken or grasped. And this is true for Jesus. God the Father has given him authority over his children, those who have been given to him, is the word that he uses. And then based on that authority, he requests that the Father glorify him with the glory that he shared with him before his incarnation, before the beginning of the world. Now we know that Jesus is talking about his death and his resurrection. For right after this chapter, after John 17, the passion begins with the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. He knows what is coming. It is the Father's will that he do this. Just as it was the Father's will for the high priest to risk his own life and go into the the most holy place to account for the sins of the people with the blood of atonement, so Jesus is doing the same. And even as he goes to the cross, he prays for you. Then he ends by really getting to the intercessory part of his prayer. He says, because they had heard the word that you, Father, have given to me, and then I have then given to them, and they believe that I have come from you, keep them in your name. Keep them in your name, he says. This is a prayer from Jesus himself for the protection of your faith in God, your identity as his child, that you have his name upon you. Keep them in your name, he says. And how are we to be kept in God's name? Because Jesus is about to die on the cross and rise from the dead, and he stays for a little while, but then he leaves. And we learned a few weeks ago, he sends whom? The Holy Spirit, the Helper. Next week, we'll be celebrating Pentecost when that Helper comes upon the apostles and the church is born. So how are we kept in God's name? It is through the church. It is through the church that Christ himself has established through his apostles, through the giving of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned to the kids, the name of God is placed upon you in your baptism. You have been marked as one redeemed by Christ the crucified, baptized into His name most holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have been marked as one atoned for by the blood of Jesus. And now that no longer needs to happen once a year, for Christ has accomplished once for all the atonement of his people. And then once our new life in Christ begins with baptism, we are sustained in that new life by the gifts of the Holy Spirit through the word of God, as you gathered here today to hear his word and receive it in joy, you have received the Holy Spirit who strengthens your faith in promise in the promises of God, who guards and protects you from 
the assaults of the devil who, like in our epistle stated, is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. He cannot stand the Word of God. He cannot be in its presence. And then the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The very body and blood of Jesus given in atonement to redeem you as children of God, to wash away your sins. The sacrifice of His blood made to wash you clean. Now remember when Jesus speaks all these things that have been given to him and that he in turn has given in his word, these gifts are an eternal redemption, an eternal life for us, for the faithful, for those who have been called under his name. And here Jesus is praying on your behalf that you be kept in his name. That puts a little different tenor to the struggle of the Christian life. It turns out that we don't have an offensive battle, but rather a defensive one. One in which our Lord helps us every step of the way to keep us in His name. And He fights on our behalf through the Word. Right? Everybody knows the armor of God imagery. Everything about that is defensive except for one thing, the sword of truth which is God's Word. It doesn't do much good against our enemies in this world, but against the true enemies, it deals a a deadly blow. So take heart, for your Lord prays for you. Now, the context of this prayer is important. As I mentioned, right after he's done, he gets betrayed and is arrested, and the whole passion sequence begins. But right before this, he's assuring his disciples. He's assuring them because he knows what is to come. He knows they're going to face tribulation. Have you ever faced tribulation? Suffering for your faith in Jesus? Perhaps having to hold to an unpopular view about life, about relationships, about what is right and what is wrong? Or even just being associated with his name brings mocking and derision. Well, Jesus knew His disciples were going to experience that. Our gospel reading today began with, when Jesus had spoken these words, which is always an indicator that the previous stuff is connected to what comes next. And what is the previous stuff? Well, here's how Jesus ends the previous section. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It was always one of my favorite Scripture passages. What blessed assurance is that, that the one, our perfect high priest who has overcome the world, he is praying that you be kept in the name of God. If he is doing that of all people, the one who has overcome the world, you and I have nothing to be afraid of. Our faith is secure in His protection and in His provision. Your high priest, Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, who has given all authority in heaven and on earth, has been given to Him. The one who has overcome the world prays for you. So, Dear friends in Christ, whatever trials and tribulations you are facing today or in the future, know that they have been overcome by Jesus. And know that this same Jesus prays for you. He prays for the protection of your faith by keeping you in God's name. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. Let us pray the same for one another, that we may be kept secure in the name of our God until he returns to bring us all to himself in heaven. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.